The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a group of doctors and medical professionals did not have standing to challenge the Food and Drug Administration's removal of safeguards surrounding the use of the abortion drug Mifeprestone. Now, the FDA has removed nearly every safety standard for women's health and safety from these chemical abortion pills, which now account for more than 60 percent of abortions. If doctors who have to deal with the consequences of the abortion drug do not have standing, who does? Joining me now to discuss this is Erin Hawley. She, she's a senior counsel and the vice president of Center for Life and Regulatory Practice at the Alliance Defending Freedom, who represented the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine in this lawsuit. Erin, welcome back to uh, Washington Watch. Always great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. So I, I know this is disappointing, a disappointing result for all of us who advocate for life and the protection of, uh, of women. Uh, your your reaction to, uh, to the court decision today? Absolutely. Well, Tony, as you mentioned, it was a very disappointing uh, decision from the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court um, did not look at the merits. Uh, instead, they decided the case on a legal technicality, uh, saying our doctors uh, did not have standing. Um, but nothing changes the fact um, that the FDA's own label says that roughly one in 25 women who take mifeprestone will end up in the emergency room. Uh, these high-risk drugs, that there's nothing um, that, that should uh, allow in, in good medicine to allow young women to take these drugs all alone in their dorm rooms without ever having seen a doctor. And, and the FDA's decisions were as wrong yesterday uh, as they are today, or, or today as, as they are yesterday. Um, but we are encouraged, um, as you mentioned, um, that the Supreme Court did not decide the merits. Um, there are three states that have intervened below. Uh, those states will have an opportunity, uh, we hope, to present the merits uh, that the court did not consider. So, Aaron, let me ask you this question. If these medical professionals and doctors who have to deal with the consequences of this abortion drug, I mean, if, if they don't have standing, who does? No, that's a really good question. And at oral argument, the United States actually took the position that no one has standing. Um, the United States Solicitor General was pressed by Justice Alito, and she said, our doctors who treat these women on a routine basis, who suffer the complications from taking abortion drugs, don't have standing. She said doctors who prescribe mifeprestone don't have standing. She said a woman who's injured by mifeprestone doesn't have standing. And she suggested that the state don't have standing. Uh, thankfully, the Supreme Court did not go that far uh, for good reason. Uh, it would be an astonishing principle of administrative law if a decision that affects about 650,000 women every year involving a high-risk drug is completely unreviewable by the federal courts. Uh, instead, what the federal court did, and I think this is really important for viewers to understand, is they said that the pro-life doctors in this case are protected by federal conscience protections, and that that's why they can't sue. Now, these federal conscious protections uh, did, did not exist, according to the federal government, um, below. Uh, the government told uh, the federal courts that these protections did not apply uh, in emergency situations. Uh, then they got to the Supreme Court, and they told the Supreme Court the exact opposite. And that's why the Supreme Court uh, didn't find standing for every other court to address the issue had. Um, in fact, the Supreme Court was really clear that doctors do have standing to raise conscience rights, um, but the federal conscience protections um, in federal law are broad and absolutely protect medical professionals from performing or participating abor in abortions, even in emergency situations. Uh, of course, those federal conscience protections uh, wouldn't uh, apply uh, per se to states. Uh, so, so those states may have an avenue forward. That's interesting because this administration, like the Obama administration, whittling away at those conscience protections. So with this statement before the Supreme Court, does that somehow bolster now these protections that are out there? Some, can can uh, doctors appeal to this argument before the court as being um, a validation of those protections? 
Uh, absolutely, Tony. At the oral argument, the Solicitor General was crystal clear that these protections apply um, in emergencies in every setting. Um, and the Supreme Court actually said, and I'm quoting here, the federal law fully protects doctors against being required to provide abortions or other medical treatment against their consciences. And as you identified, that's a huge win for religious liberty and freedom of conscience because the Biden administration has been continually cutting back on those conscience protections. But because of the lawsuit brought by AHM, uh, the government really was forced to concede that those conscious protections exist and they are robust. Well, that's actually a silver lining here in part uh, coming out of this case. So th th that's some good news. But I also want to go back to what you said a moment ago, Aaron Holly, that this is not the end of the story. There are other states, I believe Missouri is one of the states, Idaho is one of those states that has a separate lawsuit regarding the FDA and the abortion drug. Can you give us an update on what is different about their case and where it stands? Absolutely. So those three states, Missouri, Idaho, and Kansas, actually intervened um, in the AHM lawsuit. Uh, so they are part of the case back at the district court, um, and those proceedings will go forward. Presumably, uh, the Department of Justice will file a motion to dismiss the states, also on standing grounds. Uh, but the states have very different standing arguments uh, than our doctors. Um, and so we'll expect, uh, we'd expect and hope the states will raise those standing arguments. Um, and, and we hope and expect that the federal courts uh, will get to actually look at the merits uh, of FDA's decision. And especially, Tony, when you look at the 2021 removal of that last remaining in-person visit, um, the FDA's data itself, uh, could, the FDA could not say uh, that women uh, would be safe without that in-person visit, uh, and yet they still remove that safeguard. Um, so, so we are hoping, um, again, that uh, the courts do have an opportunity to look into those merits. The Supreme Court didn't, based on a legal technicality. But as you said, that has the silver lining of ensuring that there are robust conscience protections uh, throughout the country. So quickly, um, Aaron, what would be the difference for the states in terms of standing uh, compared to these doctors that you represented before the Supreme Court? Absolutely. Well, the, the states have a more traditional economic harm, um, and we don't represent the states, so I'll let them speak to, for themselves. Um, but, but women who come to the emergency rooms, again, roughly 1 in 25 do so after taking mifeprestone, and some of those women uh, end up uh, in hospitals uh, that receive state funding um, and that uh, the state is injured by those uh, additional medical expenses due to harm from the abortion drugs. This is really a quintessential economic injury that the Supreme Court has recognized in many cases. Um, so the state will have that economic injury um, in addition to, to their own sovereign injury uh, in injuries. Um, many states have passed laws protecting life, um, and yet um, uh, those abortion drugs are being mailed across state lines. This is direct injury to state sovereignty. Mm. So I'd expect the states to raise these and other standing arguments. So uh, bottom line, this is far from over. Absolutely.